So, brings us to Bernard Marr, founder and CEO of the Advanced Performance Institute. As I mentioned yesterday, he is a very visible thinker in our space and some of the related spaces, performance management, analytics, big data, key performance indicators, 80,000 Twitter followers, 200,000 LinkedIn followers, and to give you a feel for kind of the echelon that Bernard is in as an influencer and as a thinker, LinkedIn actually reached out to him and asked him to be one of their people to pilot the LinkedIn influencer program. They asked a hundred of the most influential people around the globe, people you probably heard of, Barack Obama, Richard Branson, Bill Gates, Bernard Marr. So we are in very, very good company this morning. And in terms of you know, why we were excited to have Bernard, you know, there's been a lot of evolution in our space over the last couple of decades, going back to even before it was called performance management. You had Kaplan and Norton offer the balanced scorecard methodology. They got a lot of people thinking about different ways to do things. We had activity-based costing, activity-based management. Steve Player kind of challenged a lot of the traditional thinking when he wrote Beyond Budgeting. But even that was about a decade ago, and we really see Bernard as the guy who was picking up the torch and pushing our space forward, challenging organizations like you and organizations like ours to think about where business is going and how this kind of technology and applications can really support the right processes and use cases. So we have a fantastic speaker. I think he's going to bring a lot of exciting thoughts to, this, to you today. There are notepads on the table if you want to capture notes. So without further ado, please join me with a big welcome for Bernard Marr to Host Analytics World 2014. Good morning, everyone. When I speak at this level, can everyone hear me OK in the back? Very good. I was giving a presentation in China, which is now probably five, six years ago, and I asked the same question. I said, can everyone hear me OK? And there was no response. So I spoke up a little and said, can everyone hear me OK? And again, no response. And I repeated myself a few times until the lady who organized the talk said, Mr. Ma, they can all hear you. They just can't understand you. <laughs> which is never a brilliant start to a presentation. Um, what I want to do is give you my thoughts on enterprise performance management today and hopefully give you some very practical ideas and tools you can take away from today and hopefully apply from when you get back to the office uh, in a few days' time. Um, a little bit of background. I'm running the Advanced Performance Institute. This is one of the world's leading research and advisory organizations in enterprise performance management, analytics, and big data. So I help companies do all of this in practice, work with lots of big blue ship companies that you can see on the slide here, um, as well as government organization. I've advised the US government, lots of governments across the world, big corporates, as well as medium and smaller size companies. So I hopefully have a pretty good feel of what is happening in practice. Uh, the most relevant book for you is probably called The Intelligent Company. And this is what I want to talk about today. How do we do enterprise performance management a little bit more intelligently or smarter? Um, we also do a lot of research. And we have a KPI library, lots of white papers, all available on our website that you can download for free. For me, one of the biggest issues is that we are not very good at executing strategy. And what research after research finds is that less than 10% of strategies, even if they are well formulated, are well executed. You think this is staggering. Even if we have a good strategy, somehow we are unable to turn this into a reality. The other problem is, and also it's a 10% issue, that I believe less than 10% of the performance data and metrics and all the data that we have in our management reports is ever used to inform strategic decision making. And what I believe is that these two 10% issues are very closely linked. If we can do performance management a little bit more strategic, then we will hopefully be able to collect better data, produce better reports, and therefore influence decision making, which then helps us to execute our strategy better. And for me, a really good analogy 
comes from flying a fighter jet. I have done some work for the Air Force and I remember sitting down with the head of the Air Force and his eight strong team of senior commanders and they wanted to talk about the big strategic goals and all the data they needed and the only thing I wanted to talk about was how could they ever get me into a fighter jet. <laughs> and this clearly came from watching Top Gun far too many times when I was a teenager. So I asked this question so many times and I think in the end they gave in and they invited me to a, a fighter jet flight and I was well excited. And very naive at this point, I just thought I'm, I'm on the plane between two and four times a week and it's probably a bit like it, just a bit faster, you turn up, jump into a jet. Hmm, <laughs> it was very different. So I had to turn up the day before to have my medical. And you think, why do I need a medical? And then you talk to the doctor and she said to me, one of the biggest problems will be that you will be experiencing really strong G-forces. I said, what are G-forces? And she said, they're basically, when the aircraft changes direction, there's a lot of pressure on your body. And this pressure presses the blood into your lower body. And she said, the only way to describe G-forces is if you imagine you're on a, a fairground or a Disney and they have these reverse bungee jumps where you get strapped into this capsule, dragged down and then released and then you shoot up and then you bounce up and down for a bit. This split second when you get released and you shoot up into the air, this is when your body experiences these quite strong G-forces. Only that in a fighter jet, they're about 10 times as strong and they last a lot longer. So I said, okay, I'm not really worried. But she said, you should be worried a little bit because what happens when, you, when all your blood goes into your lower body is that you, you might pass out because you don't have enough blood in your brain. I was worried. <laughs> She then said, the first thing that you will notice is you get a bit of tunnel vision because the nerves in the eyes get affected straight away. And if this happens, you have to compress your stomach muscles, your abs really hard, because this will stop the blood from going to your lower body, at which point I was considering just going home. <laughs> and, but then she reassured me, she says, one of the things you'll be wearing are, is, is G trousers. I said, what are G trousers? She said, all pilots wear them, they're really tight-fitting trousers you wear over your flight overall. And there's a little tube that connects them to, your, to the aircraft. And when the aircraft detects these G-forces, these trousers inflate and squeeze your legs and lower body quite hard. And this then stops the blood from going there. Great. Then I had my weighing for the ejection seat settings, which is also good. <laughs> and then I had a very nervous, nervous sleep. The next morning I then turned up, fired up, was ready to go, met the pilot and said, let's go. And he said, no, we can't go yet. We have to plan this mission because there has to be some training value in all of this for me. And what we need to do is we need to sit down and plan where we're going and there has to be a purpose for this training session. So we sat down and I asked him, what do you suggest? And he said, we fly out to the sea, do some interesting maneuvers, then find this mountain range, follow this mountain range up into the mountains and then the purpose of this mission could be to drop a bomb on a bridge that is high up in the mountains. So that sounded great. We then printed the flight path out. And you have a clear plastic pocket on your flight overall, and this is where the map goes. So when you sit in the plane, you never ever forget what this mission is all about. So I stand ready, and he said, no, you just have to watch this health and safety video. I said, great. So I put this on, saying these aircraft are really safe, nothing is going to happen. However, if something goes wrong, or the, or the pilot says the word eject, then you've got this big red lever between your legs, and you pull this, and this will catapult you out of the aircraft. Don't worry about anything. You will have, have a parachute strapped to your back. This will open automatically. You will then land somewhere, and we will track you and send a helicopter to pick you up. I was nervous again. <laughs> And then the video continued saying, and when you pull this red lever, that usually works. <laughs> but if it doesn't work, then you unscrew this, and you unscrew this, and you unbuckle this, and unbuckle this, and then you turn the aircraft upside down, and by gravity you will fall out. <laughs> so, I, I will remember exactly that. Thanks for, thanks for sharing. So we then got strapped in. We took off, 
and very quickly I realized it was nothing like I ever experienced before because we basically shoot, shot up, he turned the aircraft upside down, we were now flying upside down into the horizon, then your trousers inflate and you have got this funny pressure on your body, it's really bizarre. And I'm sure they've got bets on how long you last as well, so he was doing his best to, I think, make me throw up. So I struggled for the first 15 minutes, and then finally we found this mountain range and I was feeling a bit better. We then dropped, or pretended to drop our bomb. And then what he didn't tell me is that another aircraft turned up and then they chased each other, at which point I think my body gave up and I said, please, can I go home? <laughs> and, and he then said, okay, obviously mission achieved, let's go above the clouds, and what I will do is I will give you control for a bit. And he said, it's a bit like being car sick, you never, you never feel sick if you're a driver, only when you're a passenger. So when I had the controls, I was recovering and feeling a lot better, and the plane was doing exactly what, it, what I wanted it to be, to be doing. And even though I'm sure he was doing lots of stuff I didn't understand. And then we talked about the dial in front of us and the dashboards and how they used this to navigate. And he was saying that they basically look onto the dashboard and they know exactly where they are in relation to where they should be. They don't have to look out of the window. And I guess if you fly into the clouds, you have to know exactly where you are in relation to where you should be. So you have your map on your thigh and then you have a dashboard that tells you exactly where you are in relation to where you should be. Which I think is a great analogy of good performance management systems. We then also had to, he then informed mission control that I was now taking over and mission control does something else they monitor the airspace around the aircraft and look for any dangerous weather conditions they look for any un un unidentified aircraft so what you have is this really good operational dashboard but also there's something going on more strategically checking out what is what is happening around you we then finally went back landed I was so glad I got strapped out and I had wobbly knees. This was 11 o'clock in the morning and I was saying I'm off to bed. I never realized how physically exhausting all of this was. And he said, no, you can't go to bed yet because we have to complete this after action review process. So I had to go into a debrief room with him and the other pilot. And we then sat down and talked about what was good, what was bad. And watching the, the Elite squad do this is really amazing. They are called the Red Arrows, and they are flying at a few hundred miles an hour, a few feet from each other, doing crazy stuff with aircraft. And they very often videotape their training sessions, and they then go back into the debrief room, and then they watch the video. And then they go around the room and say, this was good, this was bad. Very often starting with the squadron leader who heads the, the team up, who then says, I think towards the middle I gave you command too early, which meant our display wasn't quite right. So now let's talk about how we do this differently next time. And then they might advise them that towards the end, some of you pulled in too sharply, and again, they talk about how they do this differently next time. And what is even more interesting now is that they are now downloading lots of the um, sensor data from the aircraft to also understand how the aircraft has functioned they download data on how well they hit the targets in their training sessions. So they have all of this new data now available. The other thing that's happening is all the modern aircrafts that air forces around the world are ordering now are unmanned aircrafts, drones that are used and you can remote control from anywhere in the world. And again, what they are doing is they're collecting images, they're collecting GPS data, sensor data, so all these new forms of data. And they're collecting so much information that they're, at the moment, unable to actually analyze all of the rich data that is coming back. And for me, this is very similar to what lots of organizations are faced with at the moment, that we now have more data, more and new types of data, and what we want is we know that they give us a better picture, but we want to start to use this to make better informed decisions. So, this brings me to another issue. This, not only these aircraft are becoming smarter, but our world is becoming smarter. We now all carry around smartwatches that have 
cameras in them, that have GPS sensors in them, they track how fast we're going into what direction. We now have smart watches that are also collecting our body functions. We even have smart diapers. So the first generation of these smart diapers would basically have a sensor in them that collects data when your baby needs changing and then sends you a tweet saying, please change your baby. As a father of three, I know when my baby needs changing, so I thought this is a bit of a gimmick. But actually, the later version of these are really interesting because they are collecting, the date sensor is now collecting so much more information. This is sending it to your smartphone, which is then sending it to a cloud server to be analyzed, and then sending it back to your smartphone, and it will alert you about the sodium levels in your, your baby's diet, the hydration level, so you know if your baby has too much salt in the diet, if it's not getting enough water, and it will even look for possible infections. And this for me is amazing, because this is where the world is going. We are becoming smarter in everything we do. And therefore, businesses have to become smarter. So, the framework I want to talk you through today has five steps in them where we start with being very clear about our strategic objectives. A bit like the fighter jet when I met the pilot and said, okay, what is, what is the purpose of this mission? What information do we need? We then need to collect good management information, the second step. And we need to go beyond measuring everything that is easy to measure and move towards the things that actually give us the biggest insights and really help us to make better informed decisions. Once we've done this, we then need to analyze this data and turn this into insights. And then we need to report and communicate this data much better than we normally do. And then we need to make sure we make better informed decisions. And run the meetings a bit like in the, in the Air Force analogy, where we have a strategy, we have good metrics, we use them, we analyze them, and then we make better informed decisions. And hopefully in each of these steps, I can give you some very practical tools and examples of how companies that I work with do this in practice. And hopefully you find some of this useful. When it comes to, your, to agreeing your strategic priorities and being clear about what it is you need to know, I believe that questions are the most important tool. And if you take one thing away today, take away the idea of defining a number of questions that will then drive your measurement and data collection and reporting. As I said, I've worked with so many different big companies around the world, and one of, one of the companies that does this really well is Google. And their executive chairman, Eric Schmidt, now says they're running Google based on 35 questions. So they are They've gone through this, really identified what are our strategic priorities, what are the big unanswered questions in our business, and therefore what data do we need to help us answer those questions. I've re recently worked with the second largest retailer on the planet, Tesco, who is just after Walmart. And the, after the session we had with the executive team, their CEO went down to the data and analytics team and told them, I know you're trying to build the biggest database in the world. What I, I want you to stop this now. And I want you to build the smallest database in the world that gives us answers to our most important questions. And this is so important. And this is a bit, when I did my PhD training at Cambridge, one of the first things you learn is how do you do good, good research? How do you develop new knowledge? And the first thing you do is you define a question. And then you decide how to collect data to help you answer your question. You don't start with the data. So the concept that I've developed is called key performance questions. So a bit like key performance indicators, but it's a step in between. But before we talk a little bit more about how we do this, I think we need to set this in, in, into the context of our strategy. And for me, when I talk about a strategy for a business, I compare any business with an apple tree. 
And if you compare your own business with an apple tree, the first question you have to ask yourself is, okay, why, have, why are we growing apples? Why have we got this apple tree? And if you're a commercial company, then the reason to have your apple tree would be to make money, develop, deliver return to the shareholders. Then you need to decide, okay, now what sort of apples do I need to produce? Are they red apples, green apples, what kind of taste, what kind of shape? So we need to understand our customer value proposition. What are we delivering to our customers that will then help us make money? And then we look at the trunk of the tree and define what is actually holding this tree up. What are the, the vital few things we have to excel at? What do we have to be really good at in order to deliver those red apples in order to make money? But a bit like a tree, this is all we see. We see the trunk, we see the top of the tree and the foliage. What we don't see are the roots. And we all know that the roots are vitally important because if we don't take care of the roots, the tree will, grow, uh, will basically die in the long run. And this is true for companies as well. There are lots of unseen things, the culture, the leadership style, the skills of our people, the core competencies, the relationships with our key partners, all these intangibles that we all know are really important, our brand image and reputation. And what we need to do is we need to basically populate this tree picture and say, okay, we're here to make money, what are our goals? The next level down, what apples do we need to deliver to our customers? What are the markets we're targeting? What are the customer objectives? Then we need to define the trunk and saying, what do we have to be really good at, as well as the enablers that sit underneath? Companies who do this really well turn this tree picture into a one-page map that says, this is the cause and effect map of how we are making money. And it then spells out that the financial results is an outcome of all the other things that are enablers of hopefully making money in the future. These maps have to be unique. I now help companies develop these maps in a single week. So we come in, we work with the executive team, I analyze the data, and then we have another workshop at the end where we then finalize this. And I've done this for some of the largest businesses on the planet, and we, you can do this in a single week. But these maps have to be unique. So these are other examples of how companies have, or organizations have translated this strategy into a one-page picture. So the one on the, on the left is the FBI, who again created a map saying this is our strategy and our, the reason we have a tree is to make sure that we protect the US from foreign and, uh, and, and terrorist threats and we make sure that we, we protect civil liberties and we make sure that we fight key crimes. So again, these have to be unique and another example is Tesco's, the retailer that I mentioned before, they decide to have a, a wheel where they again define this corporately, say, corporately we have a few financial objectives, we want to make sure we, we grow sales, we want, I want to make sure that we maximize profits, and we have to manage our investments because this company is one of the largest private land and property owner in, owners in Europe, so there's a huge bit of portfolio on land and buildings they have to manage. But then they make this relevant even to a store level, so the, the picture on the right is a store version of this, which they then cascade. And there they don't talk about mentioning investments because it has absolutely nothing to do with the store. The store has to drive sales and they have to control waste and control their expenses. So if they drive sales, this grows revenue. If they control waste and minimize expenses, this drives profitability. So they are all nicely aligned, but they're made relevant. So the point I want to make here is that these one-page maps are so powerful, but we have to make sure they are representing your business. And I've done them for three different big major retail banks, and you think, aren't they all the same? They all look different because they all target different customers. They have different, uh, they have different internal process priorities. They definitely have different priorities around the people they need to recruit, the skill, the leadership style, and so on. Sometimes they look very similar on the financial layer. 
because they all have to deliver a relative shareholder return compared to all the other banks. I've done the same with big oil companies where I again work with three different ones. And again, the top layer looks very similar. As soon as you go beyond finance, it looks very unique and it has to. So once we have the map, we then define the question. So we take the strategic objective that we have articulated on the map and then we define one or two KPQs, key performance questions, saying what are the big unanswered questions? What is it we need to know? And then we decide what KPIs and metrics we need that will help us answer our questions. And this one step in the middle is so important. And I find that this adds one of the, the biggest value to most of the clients I work with, who now say that actually those questions are becoming more important than the indicators itself. And if you think about this, in the indicators are simply just a spotlight that you're lighting up. So if you're trying to figure out how intelligent someone is, and we want to measure this, we normally run an IQ test. It's okay, this person now has a really high IQ, so we think this person is really intelligent. Is that really the case? Because I, when I worked at Cambridge, my office was next to a very well-known physics professor who was always held up as one of the brightest people in the country with the highest IQ. My theory was if you left this guy alone, he would probably starve to death. So I wouldn't class him as, <laughs> I wouldn't class this person as overall intelligent. So research has identified about six different facets of human intelligence. There's our mathematical and logical reasoning. This is what an IQ test measures. But there's also our hand-eye coordination. Are we physically good at doing things? There's our spatial awareness, our emotional intelligence, and other spiritual intelligence. So there are different forms of intelligence. And together, they form this cube that makes up our intelligence. If we try to measure our intelligence with a simple measure like an IQ test, this is like shining a spotlight just on one side of this cube. And even this one side is not measured perfectly because we all know that we can train to pass IQ tests. And this is something we get wrong quite often, that we very often assume that the KPIs and metrics we have represent the whole picture. And this is why the question layer is so important, that you say, my question is to understand how intelligent you are, and an IQ test is one of the metrics that will help me to form an opinion on this, but there are other metrics as well that will give me a more rounded picture. So this leads me now to the next step. We now need to find the right data. And what I see in practice is that it feels a little bit like sending a child into a candy shop and say, they look at this big wall full of nice, tasty sweets, and they say, what do you want? And they say, oh, I want this and this and this and this and this and this and this. And then they end up with a huge bag of candy. If they eat all of this, they will feel very sick at the end. And I feel that the way we design lots of the metrics in our companies is a bit similar. We say, what would you like? And people say, I want this metric and that metric and this. And then you end up with this huge bag of KPIs that makes people feel pretty sick as well. <laughs> so we need to do this a little bit more intelligently. And this has always been a problem, but is now even a bigger problem because of this phenomenon that the world is becoming smarter, and with a smarter world comes more data. Just to put this into perspective, if you take all the data that has been created from the beginning of time until the year 2010, okay? All of this data, the same amount of data will be generated every minute by the end of this year. And you think, why would that be? How can that be? Things that are driving this are our smart 
It's our smart technology. We all carry around smartphones that collect data on where we are at any given point in time. We have social media. We use, we upload pictures onto Facebook. Our conversations are increasingly recorded. So we send emails to people, and there's a record of this. We send Twitter messages and Facebook messages to people. We upload pictures and videos. We ring a call center, and they record the conversation. We walk into a building, and there are CCTV cameras that capture what we're doing. So all of this is, all these sensors, the social media traffic, is generating so much more new data. And most companies are not even touching the old world of traditional KPIs really well, let alone some of the new world of what they call big data. Well, we now have so vast volumes of data that are actually too big for our traditional databases. But we now have technology that allows us to capture this and analyze it. So, just to give you a flavor, we now have, in, instead of just looking at numbers, we can look at text. And we can analyze text, and we can understand the sentiment of what people are saying. So, Unilever, for example, I visited the other day, they now have a, a command center that monitors tweets and Facebook messages in real time, trying to understand what people are saying, and they're running a sentiment analysis of all the brands that they have and how people respond to those. And they will pick up if there's bad sentiment and the message is starting to go viral, that they can respond to this. They're doing the same now for their employment brand, because they said, we want to attract the best people, so we need to monitor how the people that we want to attract, how do they see us? And we now can collect data on this. We are uploading about 200 million new pictures to Facebook every day. So this is a, a vast amount of data that we can use. And I believe that Facebook is actually a really dangerous company because they have more data than any other company on the planet had about us, us as individuals personally. Because we've told Facebook what we look like, when our birthday is, where we live, who our friends are. And they're using the image technology. So for example, you, they know what you look like. And they will scan the rest of the internet to find other pictures of you. And they will look who else is on this picture. And they will say, oh, you probably know these people, so we suggest them as friends to you. So this is pretty harmless, but what they're now starting to develop is a really much more high-level analysis of pictures, where they're painting a scenario that, for example, you've just uploaded your latest vacation shots onto your, your Facebook page. And by comparing this picture to your last picture, Facebook has learned that you've just put on some weight. And they also know that you are falling into this 5% bracket of the people that actually put on the more, most weight over the vacation period. So they can now auction off this knowledge to companies like Weight Watcher, saying, why don't you want, you might want to place an ad into this population, because they are your perfect target audience. Verizon recently filed a patent where they basically used the a microphone that is built into the set-top box to understand the conversations that take place in the room where the TV is in. And they said they can analyze this data, and they can pick up that you and your partner might have an argument. And again, they can use this information to then make sure that marriage counseling services know that they want to stream some advertisement in the next ad break purely for you. So all of this is already happening and starting. And likes as well. Simply analyzing the likes on Facebook will now allow Facebook and others to almost with 100% accuracy predict your intelligence, your sexual preference, even your emotional stability. So suddenly we have all these rich forms of data available and we need to start using them. And I guess personally we're starting already to use them. One of the, the devices I use is an upband. So this is, I guess, a, a predecessor to lots of the smart watches that are coming out. And this is collecting data on how well I run, how well I exercise, how many calories I burn, how many calories I've eaten in a day. But it also monitors my sleep. 
and it monitors how much deep sleep I get, how much light sleep I get. So you think, why would you want to know this? The nice thing is you can set this up as a smart alarm. Because we all have, at the moment, most of us have, have pretty dumb alarms. We say, please wake me up at 6 o'clock in the morning, and the alarm goes off. This will monitor my sleep and then say, there are certain times when it's better to wake up. If you wake up out of a deep sleep, you will feel tired for the rest of the day. If you wake up out of light sleep, you will feel refreshed. So this device will monitor my sleep and then say, actually, it's now quarter to six, and you can set the boundaries of how much earlier you're happy to be woken up. You say, it's quarter to six, but now is a really good time to wake up, much more natural, and then it will start to vibrate and wake you up. The other thing you can do is you can have a, a smart power nap. I mean, I travel a lot between continents, so sometimes it's important to go back to my hotel room and catch up with some sleep. Again, you press a button saying, give me the, the power nap that I need, and it will again analyze my sleep the night before, and then wake me up after anything between 15 and 40, 45 minutes, again, calculating the, most, the best time I need to recover from the sleep or the lack of sleep I've had the night before. What is interesting as well is that this company is now completely transforming their business model. In the past, they produced devices, stuff that they were selling. Now, they are a data company. Up, the company behind this up band is called Jarbound, and they are collecting 200 years of sleep data every single day. Because all the data I'm collecting goes to their cloud server, and they have this, and they can start analyzing data. And this is unprecedented. No other company on the planet has this kind of data. So we are, again, developing new forms of data that we can then analyze. And they can now predict that after a big football game, how many hours sleep people are losing, or how long it takes for people to recover when they fly from San Francisco to New York or the other way around. So this is all fascinating stuff. What this also allows us to do is get the balance right between some of our traditional financial indicators and some of the qualitative data, uh, qualitative data sets. There's a really good quote by Albert Einstein, no, no, a really good quote by a philosopher now 3,000 years old saying, without numbers, we can understand nothing and know nothing. So this is very true. If we don't have numbers, it's a bit like the, aer the aircraft analogy. If we don't know where we are, we are completely lost. It's like walking into the desert without navigation. You don't know where you are. Contrast this with a quote by Albert Einstein, who said that not everything that counts can be counted. And not everything that can be counted counts. And this is really important. We don't get this right, the, this balance between understanding what is important. So for example, love. We all know that love is quite important in our lives will contribute to our overall happiness if we, if we know we are loved and we have other people that we can love. But do we then get up in the morning and say, on oh, my love scale, I'm three, I'm six? We don't do that. And this because it's quite hard to measure, we tend to ignore this. And I believe with all of this new technology, we now have the ability to capture a lot more of this data. So let me give you some examples. Um, this is, and there's two examples here. They're both from retail. The first one is from the big retailer, Tesco. One of the strategic objectives on their, their plan was we make, want to make sure that the queues are not too long at the checkout. So if the lines are getting too long, they want to do something about it. And they want to monitor this. So when they first introduced this as an objective and one of the big questions, they ask check out supervisors to collect this data once an hour, manually. We all know what's happening here. They are really busy. They're making up the numbers at the end of the night. Or even if they don't, then they might still miss some really important peaks and troughs in between. So then they changed this and said, actually, what we want is we want the checkout person who scans your, your food. That person can do that. And in their script, it then says, okay, can you please check how long the queue are, and then type in a number. So this was more real time, was better. But it was costing them quite a lot of money, because if you multiply these few seconds it takes by all the tills, by all the stores, it suddenly becomes a big number. So then said, we can install sensors over the, over the checkouts. 
they will automatically pick up how many bodies are in a queue. So this was cheap technology and was giving them real-time data. What they're now doing is they're using CCTV footage. They realize that they have cameras all across their store. In the past, this was data that was just wasted. So they had different databases that monitored different parts of the, the, the supermarket. This was then overwritten um, a week later. Only if someone got caught stealing something, they would use this as evidence. What they realize is this is so powerful information. If we put all of this data into one database, put an analytics layer across that allows us to do patent recognition, they can then scan you when you walk into the supermarket and then follow you around and know where you're going, what you're looking at, and suddenly you have so much information, almost for free. They know about conversion rates, they know about where you're going, what you're looking at, whether you're buying something, and they know how long the queues are at any given point in time. But you don't have to spend a lot of money on this, because the other example comes from the com complete opposite, a tiny little fashion retailer that I work with, and they have six outlets and they wanted to understand how many people actually pass our shop and how many people of them stop and have a look at the shopping window and how many of them then walk in and how many of them buy something. I said, how, how can we find this out? Unless we do a big study, we ask people to monitor the, the footfall in front of our stores because the data they were relying on was now five, five years old when the, the town did some analysis on how many people walk on different parts of the road. So they invest in a little device that picks up our mobile phone signals. And because we all carry around mobile phones, it basically counts the number of phones that pass by, i.e. the number of people walking by. It also picks up how many of them stop and how long they stop for and how many of them walk into the, into the store. And then they combine this with their own transactional data to look at conversion rates. And this is, for me, where a lot of value comes in. The other thing we did with this small shop was they wanted to recruit influential people, people that are liked, and people have lots of friends and big social networks, because they know if we, rec if we recruit the popular people into our shops, all their friends will come and buy. So in the past, they had to do interviews and then make a judgment of how popular people were. Now, they use the cloud score. All of us have a cloud score. This is basically your, a measure of your social media influence, so on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, all the other networks. And it's bringing all of this information together, creating a, a score on how influential you are. In the, in the beginning, this was pretty basic, looking at the number of connections you have. This is now much more sophisticated, looking at real engagement levels, how you people interact with your posts, what are they saying, the sentiment behind what they're retweeting, and so on. And because we all have one, when people apply, they simply check them out and say, what is the cloud score of this person? And then they invite those people in with a high cloud score. The other thing is lots of the other data that we very often collect, like our customer satisfaction data. I did some work with a number of hotels, and very often when I start working with them, they feel that their data is not too bad. They have some customer satisfaction survey data saying 80% uh, of our customers are satisfied with, with our service. And then you dig a little deeper and say, okay, well, what, do they, what are they really satisfied with? Why do they come and stay here? What do they like and what don't they like, and suddenly you realize they have no data. They have a few numbers, but very little insights. And they can't even tell you whether the 80% is good or bad, because they have no benchmarks. So what we then put in place is we replace their 15 question survey, which in my view is very often designed quite arrogantly, because they're saying, I know exactly what you want, and here I'll give you 15 questions that ask you, have I given you what I think you want? instead of turning this around, saying, what do you actually want? So what we put in place in this one hotel group is the net promoter score, the NPS, which asks a single question saying, how likely are you to recommend us to a friend? And this is measured on a 10-point scale from very unlikely to very likely. The beauty of this is 
if you get a score, you can compare this with your industry, with your country, so suddenly you have a number that means a lot more than the 80% they had before. And then we supplement this with two more questions. One, saying, what do you really like about, about staying here? And what could we do better? And suddenly, by getting rid of the 15 questions, turning this into a nice-looking, fancy survey that only had three questions, the response rate went up, and the feedback was so much more interesting, because they learned so many things they never had learned before. And we did the, something, something similar with a, a big telecom company recently, where they had a, a staff survey. Again, most people hate their staff surveys. They're usually 50 questions long, um, very rarely is the data ever used to really inform decision making and what we did is we replaced this 50 question survey with again three questions saying how likely would you be to recommend this company as an employer to a friend and then what do you really like about being employed here and what do you think we could do better as an employer we also realized that doing this data collection once a year, or even sometimes less frequently, is crazy. Because you get one data point every 12 months. So how can you pick up trends? How can you really analyze this? So we then said, why don't you sample the workforce? So you send 8% of them a survey once a month. So over the year, they get the whole lot. You as an individual only get a survey once a year, but the company gets really useful data every month and they pin, can pick up trends. So there are lots of things we need to do better when it comes to collecting data. We need to get the balance right between some of the financial and non-financial indicators and we really need to collect data that helps us to answer our questions. Then we need to turn this into insights. We need to analyze it. And what most companies are not bad at is collecting data after they have made a decision, to then justify the decision. What we're not so good at is collecting data before we make a decision. So this is especially running experiments, A-B testing. If we do something, will it make a difference? So website, uh, companies like eBay are doing this fantastically well, where they're now running different versions of their website at any point in time. And they compare how good they're doing. And they realize that by changing certain things on their website, the click-through rate is much bigger on this experimental site. And then they switch over, make this their real website. And they have a number of experiments going on at any point in time. And this is something we're not good at in general. The other thing we have to be better at is testing our business model. So we have created this tree picture. We believe that by going for these markets and satisfying those customers, this will drive financial performance. But sometimes it's worth checking whether this is actually the case. So I did some work for one of the biggest retail banks in the world, and they found that 80% of their customers actually make them no profits. They were all extremely happy, extremely loyal, but not profitable. And you then have to really reconsider your strategy because you felt another great example was we did some work for, for one of the largest airlines in the world. And again, what they found by testing all the different data sets is that when the plane was late, customers were happier. You think, how can that be? And we found that when the plane was late, the perception of cabin crew service was better in this airline. And this was the biggest factor that would influence our loyalty and overall satisfaction. So there was a certain cutoff point. If the plane was delayed for more than 45 minutes, there was nothing they could do. But they knew that actually when the plane was 20, 30, 40 minutes delayed, they can turn this around. And not only turn this around, but turn slightly disgruntled customers into real advocates, into more loyal customers. Again, completely challenging their business model. So once we've run these experiments, we've tested our business model, we then need to communicate and report. And this is something we don't do very well either. The example I often give is NASA. When, when NASA launched the Challenger aircraft, there were lots of engineers at, at the base who knew that there was a problem with one of the O-rings, and if they launched the aircraft at a certain point in time, the temperature would be too hot, and this would 
potentially break this O-ring and could have a real devastating effect. So what those engineers did is they did all their testings and they sent about 60 pages of very detailed analysis to NASA headquarters saying, here you go. Anyone looking at this data will know that this is too dangerous to launch the, the space shuttle. People looked at the headquarter, people looked at this, and nobody, nobody understood the message. Which then ended, they ended up launching the, uh, the space shuttle, which then ended up in a, in, a, in a big tragedy. So for me, there's a, again this analogy here that lots of finance people believe, and they like their spreadsheets, they like their analysis, and they believe that people will understand this. There's again lots of evidence that people won't. 60% of the population hates Excel, and they hate Excel to an extent where they wouldn't even open an Excel attachment to their email, let alone getting excited about analyzing the data. <laughs> so what we need to do is we need to do this a bit better, and this is typical, I see this a lot, dashboards of KPIs, and I mean seriously, do you get excited looking at something like this? And you think, what, what, what kind of behaviors does this trigger? I've sat in so many board meetings where you look at these dashboards, and then people say, okay, this KPI is up, and this is red, and this is green. And then you have little micro discussions. So you, go, you delve straight into the detail, very often leading to people questioning the data and then saying, I want more data. So they are not working. The other thing that's not working either is pretty dashboards. So we now have Alatus, our great new software package that has all these graphic engines in them. And then the person who is now putting the report together thinks that they have to have at least 300 different types of graphs in all their performance reports. <laughs> and this is probably worse. Because I now do a whole two-day session teaching finance teams of how to communicate data better. And there's a lot of stuff that is never taught in business school, that how we actually effectively communicate. And for me, one of the most important analogies is newspapers. Because if you think what newspapers do is they take a lot of information, they analyze it, and they then interpret this information and put this into a front page. And this front page has a headline in it saying, this is what happened. When have you last seen a dashboard or an Excel spreadsheet in your company that had a headline saying, this is what's happened? So you don't, people don't need to delve into the detail and analyze it for themselves. So we want to make it easy for people. The second thing that newspapers do is they give us a good visual, a picture that puts the headline into context. And they give us a short narrative saying these are the key facts that you need to know. And then they will point you to page eight. And on page eight, you can read the, the in-depth interviews and all the details. And you might get some in-depth charts and more detailed graphs. What we do in companies is we only give people page eight without the front cover, without the headline, without the good picture, and without the narrative. And if you think how we communicate performance is in stories. So if we use a good narrative and package it in a good story, the communication and understanding of performance will be transformed in the organization. So I've done this with a number of companies recently where we completely changed the way performance is reported. Much more storytelling, much more visuals using headlines. So this is an example here of a template that I created for one of my clients. And we say, okay, this is my objective, and it starts with their one-page strategy. You drill down to this, and you see an, a red arrow pointing down, so you know straight away this is not doing, going very well. And then you say the question was, to what extent are we winning the right new business? So if this is the question, the headline is, we are currently not. And we don't do this kind of stuff. We give people the data. We then also say, because they have two different businesses, that the, aeros the aerospace business that we have, we lost a few projects recently, and we have a big car retail group, and 
and consumer confidence in the country is still picking up, so car sales are still quite slow. And then we have two pictures. And the pictures we created were relevant to these two sides. One is the aerospace business that is bidding for big projects. So the bubble is the size of the potential revenue of a project. The axis on the bottom is the different bidding stages the projects are going through. And the other axis is the likelihood of success. The little bar, the red bar, is the relative profit margin in it. And suddenly, you have a lot of information in one picture that helps you to really answer your strategic question. At the same time, this kind of picture would be completely meaningless for the car group because they're not bidding for any, any big project. So the one on the right is for the car group that is looking at tracking car sales in comparison to overall consumer confidence in the country. And they found a 92% correlation. So they make sure that they stay in line. And then they also track online sales because this might potentially threaten their overall business model. So this is something we need to do better. The first thing we then need to do is we need to pick the right chart. And pie charts are completely overused. Um, my advice is not to use them at all. Um, because if you have more than four slices in a pie, our brain finds it really hard to distinguish. So if we now look at this picture, for example, this is a pie chart I see a lot. And then you see a brain and eyes moving from one side, trying to match the color of the legend to the color on the pie chart, trying to figure out the relative sizes, and you're starting to get a migraine. Whereas if we then translate this into a bar chart, suddenly it all makes a lot more sense. It's so much easier to read. But bar charts, again, we need to use them in the right way. We not only have to pick the right chart, we need to use it right. And this is, again, I just asked Excel, please give me a, a bar graph of these different sales figures here. So first, our brain looks at it and thinks they're all different things because they're different colors. And now, try to figure out which one's in third and fourth place. And we start again, more trying to match the legend with the colors, trying to figure out where we are. And the same data just presented in a pie chart that is simpler is so much easier to read. So we want to take away clutter like grid lines. We always want to make uh, bar charts horizontal because when we have a long space for the labels so they don't end up in a little legend somewhere else. And we always want to order them in size so it's easier to read. And then of course there are different types of, of graphs, more innovative ways of showing data. So the one on the left is the population density across the US. And it's basically little bl bubbles blowing up in the really densely populated area. And for me, this is a really nice, innovative way of visualizing data. It's really easy to read. And whenever we can use maps, they are good. Because the, the one on the right is showing us overall life satisfaction across the world. And again, you can see how you want to have a conversation about this straight away and how much it engages you. And this is the type of, of graphs we have to produce. And what I now find myself doing a lot for my clients is that we turn all of these insights into infographics that are combinations of graphs, pictures, headlines, traffic lights, and texts that really engage people. And in one of the big entertainment companies, they now have almost magazine types performance reports. The flick, so they look like a magazine. They're called pop, perspectives on performance. They have a nice picture on them, little headline saying the three things that came out of our employee survey. And then you open this up and you see these infographics about the key issues in the organization. And it changes the way people engage with it. And the final point is that we now have to make better informed decisions and turn this all into insights. And the analogy I give you here is schools. So if you think, why do we send our kids to school? To prepare them for the future, to learn, to educate. And how do we then measure whether this learning and education has taken place? Usually by exams at the end of a learning period, what we call summative assessments. The kind of behaviors it drives in kids is, how can I cheat to pass the exam? What's the minimum effort I can get away with to get the result I need? 
and now because teacher performance is also assessed on the same exam result progress, they are now training kids to pass exams instead of inspiring them to learn. So the focus here is on the past because when you get the result, if you got, got the wrong result, you're not digging up your old books and saying, I better fill some of these knowledge gaps. And there's a big debate in education saying, how can we turn this into a more forward-looking way of assessing performance, where the role of the teacher is to continuously assess progress in all kids and then identify gaps so they can then inspire and motivate those kids to learn and close those gaps. So this formative assessment is focused on the future, it's on identifying gaps in their, in, in their learning so they can do something about it. And this is something we don't do well, well in companies either. We tend to look at performance through this re rear view mirror where we look at the past and I've seen people presenting 48 slides and 45 minutes all saying this was my performance versus my target last quarter. And you think, okay, how much time do you intend to talk about the next quarter? And I said, no, this is a performance review meeting, so I look into the past. What we need to do is do this much more forward-looking. So some of, in some of my clients, we now put in place performance preview meetings or performance improvement meetings that spend 20% on the past and 80% of the time on discussing the future. A bit like the after-action review that took place in the Air Force example where they then look at data and say, how can we now learn from this and do something differently and better? And companies like Google are now doing this very effectively where they have these meetings where they look at evidence, almost like a jury in a court setting where the board sits there and say, this is the question we want to have an answer to. They very often bring the business analysts now into the meeting as an expert witness who they then can cross-examine, say, where's the data coming from? How reliable is it? Something we very rarely do either. And then they turn to a discussion, saying, okay, what, do we, what decisions are we now making? What is this telling us? And they're making one decision after the other based on their big unanswered question. So hopefully this has given you a flavor of some of the things you can do differently. And for me, the, the book I'm working on at the moment is called SMART. And this is translate this acronym of SMART is start with your strategy. Put this one page plan in place that articulates your strategy in this apple tree way and then define the questions that you want to have an answer to, so the key performance questions. The next letter is M, standing for measuring and metrics, so we need to collect the right data. And here we need to especially balance the qualitative and quantitative data and starting to integrate some of the new data sets, some of the unstructured data that we now have access to, to get a better picture. The next one, A, is analysis and analytics. So we need to turn this data into insights, running experiments and testing your business model. The next one is R for reporting. So we need to report performance in a way that people can understand really relegating spreadsheets and detail into an appendix or a shared drive and focusing on, on the messages, the newspaper front page, the headlines, the good pictures, the narratives and the storytelling. And then finally, T is for transformation. It's about using the data to make decisions about the future to transform your business and to execute your strategy so that you then end up closing this 10% gap where you have better data, probably less data, but more relevant data based on your strategy and your big strategic needs, and therefore you get better information which will then help you to execute your strategy better. Okay, I hope this was useful. Um, these are my contact details. If you want any more information, please feel free to, to get in touch. I also invite all of you to connect with me on LinkedIn. I find LinkedIn an amazing way to stay in touch with people. And as Lance said, I'm now writing blogs every week on different things of how companies measure performance, how, how, how big data is changing the world, how to use better charts, how to report performance differently. And if you're connecting with me, you will all get all of these articles all the time. Okay? Very good, this is me done. Thank you very much. <laughs>